Hey, Mark here. I have a fun announcement for you. I have five 4K UHD slash Blu-ray copies of Mean Girls up for grabs. So if you would like a copy of the 2024 film Mean Girls, shoot me a message and be like, Hey, Mark, I would like to enter for a chance to win. Please include me so I can win this cool copy of this cool movie. That's a lot of fun. So yeah. Bring home the all-new movie Mean Girls. Buy on 4K UHD and digital now. New student Katie Heron is welcomed into the top of the social food chain by a group of popular girls ruled by Queen Bee Regina George in this new twist on the modern classic. Mean Girls. Buy it on 4K UHD and digital today and get over 30 minutes of fetch bonus features. Available at participating retailers. Rated PG-13 from Paramount Pictures. Hello and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is a man who is recording this episode from inside the stomach of a sarlacc. It's John Levengood. Man, well, I mean, uh, apparently one can survive that for quite some time, g- given given uh, what we learned in The Mandalorian. Yeah, if you have some armor and a flamethrower. You know, you know yeah. I was just thinking about this. They call it the sarlacc pit, but it's just a pit that the, the sarlacc is chilling in. So it's like... It's just, is it, at that point, is it the Sarlacc? Because it's not really a pit anymore. I mean, it's really just, it's like an earthworm that came up to the surface and then just didn't stick its, you know, the front of its body yeah. above the surface, right? Is there a pit then? I mean, the pit is just, it's just this burrow, right? Yeah. I, I would say it's just, it's because, because it's entirely in those, like, like the wildlife of Star Wars books. I used to have. Yeah, me too. Stuff. Like you, you would see it and it didn't look like, you know, like a trapdoor spider, yeah. the, 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 the diameter of the hole is just a little bigger than, say, the diameter of the moving spider. But when you see the illustration of the Sarlacc pit, it, it legit is like that thing is filling all the space. Yeah, no space. So, I, like, I, I think they just call it that because either A, it it's just sits there for so long, it's just like a piece of the, the geography. Yeah. You know, they know that it's a thing. Or B... They don't properly understand that it's an animal. That makes sense. Because if you haven't seen it. I mean, you'd think it's an animal. It, it reacts. It has those tendrils that reach out. But, like, they might think that those tendrils are in, individual creatures. Like, I don't know. I, I we, You know, we never get introduced to many biologists in, in the Star Wars uh, <laughs> movies or shows. They just never explain it. It's not like Annihilation where they go in for a mission into it and tell tell us all about it. But yeah, it's what if there was a Disney show, like an animated Disney show or some, you know, Pixar esque animated thing where you're following like a show host and it's literally like a nature show. And they're just like, we're here on Tatooine and we're going to go poke that baby (laughs) Sarlacc. And then then you see like babies. Here's the great dragon, you know, you see their ecology, their reproductive cycle. Do the Sarlaccs have a mating dance? I don't know. Or they like fish and one lays eggs and then like a hundred years later, another Sarlacc finds it and just almost like salmon just fertilizes those eggs or something. Like what's the biology? It doesn't need much water, right? It probably can hold on to food for a long time because it's in the middle of the desert. How happy would you be if you were walking in the desert and you fell into an empty Sarlacc pit? You could get out. Would you like it would be kind of annoying, but you're like, well, it's better than an actual Sarlacc stomach. So I fear that those things are potentially a couple hundred feet long. There's so a slope. Felt... There's a 45 degree slope okay, that so has it's been curved. created. It's curved. You're, you're going to okay. roll for a long time. It's like it's not that deep. It's like a sidewinder in the desert, right? It, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Its head is sticking out, but it, the rest of it's just like an, uh, not even an inch under. You're going to go on a little bit of a ride, think you're going to be eaten by a Sarlacc, then you just realize it's the pit left from a Sarlacc. <laughs> would you be happy? I mean, so – Okay, the biologist in me would be terrified. And let me tell you, because like a poop? lot of times, well, that, you know, that's just, that would be unfortunate. Hopefully that's all the way at the end of the pit. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, because I'll bet, okay, ready? In the nature show, and the Star Wars nature show, they'd probably re- look into this and realize that most most things that make 
make burrows, like whether they're whether they're meerkats or pocket gophers or, or even snakes, there tend to be certain other organisms that kind of have a symbiotic relationship. Uh, like a remora. And, and they like feed specifically on their feces or the uh, the scraps of their food, maybe some kind of carrion eating things or right. And then other things come in that feed on those things. And you can have this ecology of things. But of course, because this creature, I don't know, maybe is as long as a football field. OK, well, how long, how big are the things that have this yeah. relationship with it? You know, you could have something the size, the size of a bantha crawling around in there that's just there, you know, scooping up poop. But it might not be happy that you're in there. That's a good point. Those poop banthas are, are territorial. What would you rather deal with, a poop bantha or the sarlacc stomach? I feel like my odds are better with the poop bantha. Yeah. I am not as well equipped as, as Boba Fett. <laughs> <laughs> Boba Fett. Boba Fett. Oh, man. That was good. I love the Sarlacc. And, you know, I was thinking today. So today's episode, John, one of my all-time favorite movies, Films and Flicks episodes, was in the first 100s where we talked about our favorite 60 seconds or less characters. So with May the 4th today, I wanted to get together with you and talk about our favorite minor Star Wars characters. So not like a Lando Calrissian, not like a Wedge Antilles, right? Like we're talking the the Sarlacc Pit, right? We're talking Salacious Crumb. The Gamorrean guard who gets eaten by the Rancor, those kind of characters. And maybe some have a little bit screen time, more screen time, some have less. But this is going to be a lot of fun. And you know what, what the best part was, John? In our first 100 episodes, we had a lot of listener questions. So I reached out on Facebook today, and I got a lot of questions. Can I can I start asking? We'll, we'll answer a couple, then we'll go through our like one, some of our lists. We'll answer a couple, go through the list. How's that sound? Sure. All right. So I'm just I'm I'm just dropping these on you, but they're they're really funny. So Aaron Newworth of the Out Now with Aaron and A podcast, ask, should the Rebels be training Wampas to be pilots? So we know about the Wampas, the Hoth Wampas. We know that they're pretty intelligent. They, like, they say they call them semi-sentient, white-furred, primitive species of mammal which dwelled on the snow-clad planet Hoth. So I'm going to look up their intelligence here. I, I've been reading about them. Like They, they just they, call it semi-sentient. Yeah. What, what, what you read. That, that's, that doesn't sound like super smart uh, yeah uh, like what, what would that be comparable to like semi sentient yeah i mean boy they're about nine wonder, feet you know i wonder if if whoever came up with that term and applied it to a wampa if they would call like their cat semi sentient or if their cat is sentient oh i don't know we, we need more details there, you know. Okay. But, but either way, the let's say they're smart. Though, well, let's say they're like clearly, Harry and the Hendersons. Below. Smart. Okay, I think he's quite sentient though. He yeah. had a lot yeah. of emotional. So awareness. let's do that. This is Harry and the Henderson intelligence. Okay. All right. I can deal with that. All right. Should they be training this nine foot creature to be a pilot? I mean, you're gonna need. First off, you got to design the ship for that creature though. Yeah. Nine foot cockpit. Right. That's. That's that's a that there's a there's an ask built in right there right and a new helmet so, to fit the horns. I don't even know do they need a helmet like that the horns will protect them from a lot of impacts well, maybe. But in space they need those visors. <laughs> they need, well I think I think in space George <laughs> Lucas just liked those visors. But, but that's the world though right so I mean or, that's, or is that or is that protecting your eyes from retina burn from the lasers? That's what it is. So what about just circular goggles that go around its head? There we go. I mean, yeah, that's easy enough. All right. So circular goggles, a nine foot cockpit. Bird. But I, I'm coming back to should we be training? <laughs> I want to see it. Because, like, you know, Top Gun Maverick, right? Just those pilots trying to train Wampa. That should be a movie. Top Gun Wampa. Okay. Ready? You take these, like, totally scrap yarded, like, ships. X wings, right? X right, yeah. totally scrapyard. M wings, they were just discontinued. You, you you modify them for the cockpit. Now they barely work, and then you put on like this 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 not very agile like set of thrusters, but they're big strong thrusters. And you put these guys out there, and they're just kind of like the chaotic bumper car like like uh, demolition derby 
fighters. Like you release them behind you when you are trying to just get away. Oh yeah. And and they're just kind of chaotic. And also, but they're not very trained, so they might be, you know, easier targets in a way, but because they don't have like good flight training and they don't they aren't the best at using these ships with these these ad hoc thrusters, they might have they might be kind of erratic, like a sprayed roach. You know, you know what's interesting? When you're in combat, sometimes you think your opponent's going to do the perfectly placed blow, right? You can read where they're going to swing because every X-wing dogfight I've been in, I've felt that. Like, like this Tie Fighter is a clone. This clone has a series of things that it does. This is the perfect maneuver, so I'll watch out for that. When you're flying against space wampas in like battery rams, discontinued ships, you're not going to know what they're going to do. It's going to be chaos out there. I'm telling you, Demolition Derby, man. Like, they yeah. will be like the Mad Max, Fury Road, and Morton Joe, uh, what were they called? The something boys? War boys. Yeah, like Rick. The war boys. It'll be like the war boys. And they'll just be out, just a destructive for, although on land that would really be more useful. But, but yeah, like for ship purposes, like that, I, I like that use just because it would be cinematically very pleasing and very divergent from everything that we're used to seeing with these uh these open space uh uh fighter fights yeah. fighter fights fights with with fighter jet things it, it's in open space if there's not like asteroids so yeah it's like but here's the thing are wampas as smart as wookies i don't think so because okay. i i think when you when we call them semi-sentient i think we're putting them below all of like the 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 races or species you would pick if you were playing the video game you know what i mean but Harry, I think, could fly a plane. So I'm going to give Harry. I think Harry is quite sentient. He was just uneducated. He didn't have access to a decent university in those woods. <laughs> <laughs> I love that there question. Wasn't a good, there wasn't a good Galactic Empire recruiting office yeah. out there. But yeah, I think they could be good good demolition, like, yeah, demolition derby pilots for the rebellion. Yeah. And imagine if you boarded their plane. Like, hey, we're going to board. Horrible idea. I no, I think that that's a worse idea than beating a Wookiee in three dimensional chess. Yeah. <laughs> or wait, that's Star Trek or whatever the game is. Yeah, that no, that, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah, because it'll rip your limbs out. All right, next one. Class, classic American movies. Chris Kelly asks the podcast, Classic American movies. Should the Christmas special happen again? So should we have another holiday special where they're celebrating Life Day? So remember the how classically bad. The first one is, should there be another one of those? I mean, okay, so we're, we're, we don't, we mean live action. We don't mean like the cute Lego. Yeah, Legos, no Legos ones. ones. That we yeah, were getting. They're cute Legos Cause I, ones, yeah. Because those are very nice. But so we are, we are taking the low hanging fruit or contract obligated actors who really don't want to be here. Yes. And we're jamming them into a, like a 30 minute special. Oscar Isaac um, hates being there, but he does it because he's a pro. Right. I feel like it's a bad idea. I think that I feel like you're you're asking people to do something that they're not thrilled to be doing in the first place. So I I, I think that your best possible outcome is still not great. Yeah, it just wouldn't be organic. It wouldn't be organa, Leia organa. And, and, and also, you're you're giving it a throwaway budget. Like they're not putting fifty million dollars into no. this thirty minute thing, even though they put one hundred and fifty or two hundred or three hundred million dollars into things that are you know, two, three, four times as long. So it's it's going to have, it's not going to have the budget that we are accustomed to. And I'm not saying that sci-fi always needs a budget. People love Farscape who love, you know, who loved Star Wars back in the day and Farscape didn't have the same budget, right? Or, or you know, mm -hmm. whatever, pick your sci-fi show, right? The shows just don't get the same budget. But this is different because now it's like you're watching a Star Trek show and all of a sudden there's an episode with, one tenth or one fiftieth the budget, right? It's just not gonna not gonna work. I feel like this doesn't sit well. And then if you're like, if it's not part of the canon, people aren't invested anymore because we're in the era of extended universes and franchises and anthologies. And then if it does act as part of the canon, it's part of the canon with a garbage uh budget. So unless they make a full on real like a movie. Guardians Christmas special. Right. We they won't real, make that. Need, yeah. So I, I yeah, I'm not on board. I'm not no. on board. Cuz it wouldn't be the train wreck of the original. It would just be not good and cheaper. 
you know, so, like we enjoy that train wreck now, but like back when that came out, I wonder if people were like, what the hell was that? Holy moly. <laughs> Did you tape that? Did you tape that? Cause we will never see it again. <laughs> All right, perfect. Hey, thank you. Fire. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris <laughs> Kelly from Classic American Movies. So, John, let's get on to our picks. So we'll pick, we'll each pick one. We'll go back to listener questions. Uh, what, what's your first pick? So I, I actually, uh, in the spirit of, of our, our earlier chat and Wampas and Sarlacc pits, I kind of went a very odd route with this and I went more with like the critters and well, and not just crit- critters and droids. So not not what we normally think of as our main characters, not like C-3PO droid. So my first choice is from Star Wars Episode One. By the way, I decided to give a lot of favoritism to the prequel trilogy. It's my least favorite of the trilogies, but I still enjoy the movies. You watch them a lot. I watch. Well, I watch all the Star Wars movies. OK, all of them, all of them. They, pretty equally, actually. Uh, so I, I just kind of go through them in order. Uh, like maybe once a year, I'll watch all of them once. Uh, I try to keep it. You know, although every now and then I skip Solo because it's my least favorite. Sorry, Solo. Okay, so the DUM series pit droids. The DUM series pit droids from Star Wars Episode One we see in a few places. We first are introduced to this little thing that reminds me of batteries not included when it is compacted, when you punch its nose and it compacts mm-hmm. into this little thing. But otherwise, it's this little skinny, like two-foot-tall droid with a big batteries not included body of a head and when we're first introduced it's fighting with jar jar who's my least favorite character maybe in star wars history and and while he's fighting with it you know they yell at jar jar he looks over so does the little thing look over and then it does that little autonomous kick to his cloaca or nuts or whatever jar jar has and i don't know there's something so that moment it's not the fight that makes it, but the fact that the fight, that, that little skirmish builds up to it, makes that little kick to the cloaca after that delay and pause. And they both look over like mom caught them doing something they weren't supposed to do, like really special to me. And then we see these same droids later. And I read about this online. I didn't just know this. I had to look up Wikipedia, Wikipedia. Oh, I love that. But, um, but uh, these things in, in the Star Wars world were actually made to be specifically pod race pit crew. And they have a, an actually very weak processing logic center. So they can't do anything complicated. They just do very basic tasks. And they also don't look around for dangerous things. So they, they will run through a thruster with reckless abandon or run right behind someone who's about to thrust. We see this happen in the pod race, by the way. And so, but the idea is that they just rush in fearlessly, quickly get things done. They work in numbers, right? So, so we can spare a few. And then they're making these Mosespa Grand Arena pod races happen. They're little cute mechanics that are reckless and expendable and and I think they're they're very cute, and and even when one gets destroyed, it's it, it's done with levity. You don't feel like oh my god that poor thing. Or, you know, someone might think that, but you know it, again it's kind of a funny thing though, right? It's almost like Bugs Bunny or, or Wiley e. Coyote getting electrocuted, and you see the skull, skeleton <laughs> for a second in the zap, right? We want to assume it's actually kind of okay, but but this is my this is my first pick. This this weird little these weird little things that are just so quirky. That they they have like a Christmas card like place in my heart. <laughs> oh, they're wonderful, and they pop up in Mandalorian too with mm-hmm. the the pit crew there, and they're always just I'm just I love seeing them because they can get things done, but there's also some chaos with them. Like they'll bring the wrong tool, or they'll be like just I, no, I dig them. I I love it, man. That's great, and I love the build up of that fight. And I think that's what George Lucas is great at, right? Where he creates worlds with three second characters or, or more. That you're like, hey, that was interesting. Like, that's why I like this franchise, because you have these little droids. You have these little moments that create characters. And I actually, I have one from Phantom Menace. Do you want to know? One Absolutely. Of my picks. Okay, so we've talked about this creature many, 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 many times. But I'm going to do it again, because I love the Sando Aqual monster and its gigantic biceps. Like that thing's built, man. Like, I don't know what it's, if it's just like manipulating its own body in that water with all that water resistance. Cause that thing's like two, 300 feet long, right? Yeah. It's gigantic. The sand. Yeah, like it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a leaner cousin species to Godzilla. 
And without the without the frills. Yes, it's, it's like you know when those Marvel those Marvel stars get ripped up and dehydrated for their shirtless scenes. Right. Like that's what this thing looks like all the time. And it and it's just like you know there's always a bigger fish. And I just love that. Like it can get 200 meters in length. How much does it eat? You know what I mean? Like it was eating those OPC killers quite easily. So like that that thing and its metabolism and the amount of, that it works out, it's gonna need to get protein a lot of it. And it looks like it's cleared out those caves. So its life is just basically going around <laughs> the interior of Naboo's world and just slaughtering large animals. And there's a couple of Sando aqua monsters. Like there's, yeah, there's big, and I love sea monsters. And that scene when they're going to Naboo is incredible. And that thing just has gigantic biceps and it makes me laugh. Like, that thing, it wouldn't do it in a day, right? But if that thing killed a Mosasaurus, it would it would have that it would it would have eaten the whole thing in two days. Yeah, because the Mosasaurus is only like I don't know a hundred feet long. I say only or yeah. only a hundred yeah. feet long comparatively. Right? Maybe a hundred and fifty. I'm sorry if there's a paleontologist out there who's just flipping their shit like you idiot. That's not how big a full grown Mosasaur is. <laughs> hey, either way though, to battle a Sando Aqua monster that could be get up to 200 meters in length, it's gonna lose because that thing. It's like 700 feet. <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is legit longer than a tenth of a mile. It has claws too. It like it has hands. You know, like and they they said it has heavily muscled bottles bodies that look almost feline with strong limbs ending in finned claws that propel them through the depths. Like it's like their front legs and uh and, and hands that could be used to to grasp prey. Like they're just they're just designed to hurt you. And it it must uh it must do like rock curls. I wonder if one of those ever made its like maybe maybe their their the the Gunkin City was in a protected like alcove is in the word but you know like a subterranean cavern a, a huge subterranean cavern yeah with, with their city right but like could could one of those could a Sando monster not get there though like that must be because if one of them ever found this big dome even if they can't penetrate it like they 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 could be fascinated by it it would almost be like a siege. Like it would just be waiting out there for them and they're like running out of supplies or something. Yeah. Or anytime someone's coming home from like a fishing or hunting party or whatever they do or, or, or reconnoitering hunter gathering, I don't know. Like they're coming back, they get picked off or they can't come home. Like th- that could be like an episode of a show. It's yeah. like a Mandalorian like show. I mean, that thing must have plenty to eat because it knows the Gungans are there. So it's just like, okay, I can, I got plenty of stuff down here for now. And it's probably tastier than attacking the Gungans. Yeah, they're so, so tiny. Yeah, so it's... I mean, imagine if that just lived around the corner, you know, the block from you. I'd be horrified, John. Or, or maybe, maybe it doesn't care because they're so small. Like, it would never... Realistically, I mean, we... You know, we, we like we like referencing there the there's always a bigger fish. Well, I mean... They got attacked by something that was bigger than their 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 water ship. Yeah. And then that got attacked by something yet bigger than that that could eat that. That got attacked by something that yep. You know what I mean? It's like look at look at the chain up. Like like a shark is not going for guppies. No. Like yeah. And realistically, that's what a gunkin is to to this thing. So maybe they're actually totally safe. That makes sense. Because it never even in their even one of the little water ships if they have them. Like it is still so small, it is multiple levels down the food chain in size. You know what I mean? So just it's like it's like a blueberry. <laughs> like we're not attacking skinks to eat them. Like we're carnivores. We don't see a skink and go, "I'm gonna eat that." I'm not. I'm not chasing down something the size of a blueberry if I'm hungry. <laughs> exactly. The energy that it would take to hunt down that blueberry would not be recovered by the blueberry. And and listen, that thing. The amount of calories burned, it needs to go eat another OPC killer immediately. So yeah, it's just it's not worried about blueberries. We need we have like two okay. shirts this episode that I like. It's not worried about blueberries. And then there's not another worried. one I liked. <laughs> oh man! All right, so we'll, let's do a listener question and then we'll go back to our next picks. All so right. we have Nicholas Rehack, who is a frequent guest on Movie Films of Fliff, Flicks. He's also on the Exploding Helicopter podcast, which is a podcast dedicated to movies that have feature exploding helicopters. It was just featured in the guardian. 
in the print and online versions. That's a, one of the podcasts of the week, so I'm very happy for Will Slater and Nick Rehack. Nick Rehack asks, are midi-chlorians actually a thing, or was it a lie used to make young Anakin feel special and force, pun intended, him to leave home for a new Jedi-centric life? Because they talk about it in Episode 1 and then never again. Okay, so this is kind of funny, because the midi-chlorians are one of my picks. <laughs> We'll move that into your second choice then. So, there we go. So, so uh, but yeah, so the Minichlorians, right? Are, so, no, they're a thing, right? They literally had, like, they, they sent a, a scan digital data sample back to, Qui-Gon sent that to Obi-Wan to check on their computer to look at this up. And, like, it's almost like reading a blood test. So this exists, and he's comparing it to the Count and Master Yoda, when Anakin isn't there to hear it. So we obviously, I, I mean, I know that the person saw this movie who's asking the question, but for listeners who don't remember all the details, this absolutely is a thing that existed in the movie, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's and there. So it's there and they are intracellular endosymbionts. And I think they just call them endosymbionts in the movie, but it would make sense that they're intracellular endosymbionts because we have a lot of intracellular endosymbionts. We, we generally inherit them though. Um, like literally from our parents, like our genes. But so, I mean, I don't think it was necessary to tell the boy this. I think it's just like, I'm choosing to train you. Yeah. You, you seem to have the aptitude that I'm looking for in a, in a, in a pad of one. Right. But like, what well, am I missing some of the question? Was that a multi well, like, question? Like, so what he asked was, are they actually a thing? So, so, or, or was it a lie? So it's a thing. They prove it's a it thing. because there's multiple people talking about it. They're not, so it's a thing, but then, yeah, they never talk about it again. And do they talk about it again? In two I, think, three? I think it gets mentioned uh, with in Palpatine. Council. Yeah. Uh, like it gets maybe mentioned one or two times in the new tr- trilogy. It's not mentioned. So it's right. like this thing that controls everything. And then they're like, yeah, it's just there. Like there's never mentioned again. So it's right. a thing, but it's just a thing they've kind of pushed under the rug. Well, you know, it's in that, it's that, it's that thing where, like, all these people are like, well, what's the force? Is it magic? No, it's not magic. And then, you know, you guess George Lucas is like, okay, well, I'll give you an answer. You give him an answer, and everyone's like, your answer blows, George Lucas. He's like, fine, I won't mention it again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. Oh, man. But, but the, the problem with these midichlorian counts is that the moment that I heard it, I never even – was like a Dragon Ball fan, but just from being in the room when my cousin watched it a few times, I immediately thought of Dragon Ball because they're like, oh my God, he has a power level of, you know, 700. And then later seasons, it's like 7,000. He's gone insane. Yeah. Later seasons, it's 7 million. But either way, it's like, it's always about who has the highest. But I mean, if that was it, like if everyone got trained from the same age, can we just predict that whoever has the highest midichlorian count by a significant margin is just going to, win this fight or be the better Jedi. Do so, we want kids to know this though? Like, oh yeah, well I have a 7,000 midi-chlorian count. What do you have? Like, do we want kids to know about their midi-chlorian probably levels? Probably not. Probably not. That's like telling a bunch of like, you know, 12 year olds, their IQ. It's not going to lead to anything good. <laughs> right. But, but like, but again, if, if you know these things, like, Boy, does that get under your skin? Like, what do you mean you're the head of the Jedi Council? You only have like 700. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm 950. Like, or, 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 or if, if you know that Darth Maul, I don't know how you know this, but if you could know somehow that Darth Maul had a count of 1200, I'm making up numbers, by the way. I don't know what they said in the movie or if they even said the number, but, but if Darth Maul has 1200 and Qui Gon has like 700, like, do you just run? Would you just be like, there's no way I no one's beaten Goku a chance in hell in this fight. Right. So right, like, uh, Goku's you know, got the highest the levels. To that. So, uh, so I had to watch every single Dragon Ball Z episode and pull all the stats from Vegeta. So I had to count I'm every sorry. time he yelled. I had to count. It was, I'm, I'm telling you, John, I almost went insane. But like Goku has the highest levels. Like, so then it's like Goku's just impossible to beat. So Vegeta keeps trying to catch him, but then Goku's higher. So there's just, there's levels, right? So if, uh, if you knew that there were levels that exist, I don't know. But then this opens but I have up. a question though, John. You have okay. a eight billion level mini chlorians. You're off the charts. You know huge cells. Like you have you have a mo like you get really full of yourself, you start wearing leather, you have a mohawk, you know, you don't train because you just you're like, I got it. I got it, baby. You know, you don't work. 
But then someone with like 5 million works much harder than you because they don't have it. Does that mean in a fight you would lose because you have many chlorians, but you don't really use them? Probably, probably. But, but then if you survive that and then you go train like whoever in Dragon Ball Z in their little space gym and then you come back and you're full, you can properly utilize your power. <laughs> Is that how that works? Yeah, well, so Vegeta would go train for a year, but it was only a day in the the real world. Okay. Yeah, just to get stronger. And like a hundred times Goku go do it. or something. Yeah. Didn't they do push-ups in like higher gravity or something? Yeah, up to work out, yeah. And so, like a hundred times gravity? Yeah, oh yeah, I, they have that system. That's amazing. You remember? But, it's, but yeah, yeah, the it's, problem with these, these midichlorians create a lot of problems though too, right? Because like, okay, you know that they're into symbionts. They tell us that in the movie. You know, you, you can detect them. Like, specifically you can detect them, mm-hmm. right? You know this is a midichlorian and this is a different endosymbiont. Is is anyone synthesizing these? Like, is someone, like, exposing them to stem cells and just producing a whole lot of cells with these and then, like, spinal tapping them into the emperor? I, I don't know. I don't know how that would work. But, you know, what? I, but, like, you, you yeah. could be creating these. Or, we know how to make clones, we know how to make clones. So why don't the uh, the tall, lanky cloning race from episode two, why aren't they just cloning Darth Maul? Because you would clone. So when you have endosymbionts and in your intracellular endosymbionts and in your cell divides, uh, they, you know, they go and then they reproduce appropriately to the size of their intracellular uh, ecological space. So. It's not like they'll be lower in the clone. Like you could just make a clone of Darth Maul's. The problem is that th- these midi chlorians open yourself up to a world of nonsense. Um, uh, it, it, uh, and of course, a lot of people were just saying the midi chlorians is stupid nonsense. And then other people were like, no, this is, these are just sorcerers, stupid nonsense. I want an answer. There's no, no, as usual, it's like you watch, you watch the movie and you want more answers and someone gives you the answers and you're not happy. Absolutely. No matter what he said. People would have hated it. Ryan Johnson tried to say that. Everyone tried to say that. Everyone hated it. So it's just he should have just made up so, something really funky, like the like the the like the the funky Chlorians or the uh, the pap, you know, like the this something really stupid. You know what I mean? Like the George Lucas muscle drops. Yeah, <laughs> muscle drops. But so but I don't again, know. This- you know what I mean? Anything. Just make it. I don't know. So this this was my this was my pick. This was one of my I picks though. And even though I, I I hate everything about the execution of this idea in the movie, and I don't even know how this idea, as they defined it, can exist in this world without creating you know problem cloning, uh, figuring them out, synthesize. I don't know. Supercharging them beats me. Uh, of course, then you would also say that, you know, Jedi should be having a lot of kids. Yeah. At the same time, and and with other Jedi, uh, so you know, it's like you you open you open up a a bag of worms that would just cheapen the rarity and specialness of our kind of sorceress, holy, prophesied Jedi knights and their use of this mystical force. But I like that an attempt was made, even if it missed. I like. The idea and this idea would have been a really cool idea if no movie, no Star Wars movie had been made yet. And instead you built your Star Wars movies around this idea. Yeah. Sometimes it's a pain to go back and explain things like just let it maybe just let Sleeping Dogs lie. I sense it done. Right. I right. sense because remember in the originals, I sense the force in you. I just sense the force in you. Right. So and, people, and of course, the. They give us this biological thing, though, right? And but at the same time, they refer to like a prophecy. Oh, is he the one from the? So they are they are making mystical reference yeah. here, unless they literally mean just the two to the twenty third power of number of combinations that you can have from from twenty three chromosomes crossing. Of he's that you know one and whatever that number is, it's something like sixty trillion or something he's that one in 60 trillion if you're a mathematician don't no one no one calculate this number i just made that number up but if you're the one in that number that you know that one in 18 powerballs number then maybe they're just referring to that genetic 
uh, rarity, but inevitable in the long run possibility? Or do they really mean a prophecy? Because they speak of it like a po- prophecy. And they even say bring balance to the force. This is a very mystical, peace giving, you know, the one Neo Jesus something, right? So the, the, we're, we're trying now to, in the same movie, make reference to mystical prophecies, which can't really be likened to biology the more I think about it, and a very definable biological concept that exists in the earth as we know it that you can learn about in your ninth grade biology. So we made it more complicated. I, I think it's just that this world couldn't exist as we have observed it. Yeah. If the midichlorians were that history would have been very different. This world would be, That's a good point. it would be more like a Dragon Ball Z world. Uh, you know what I mean? Where, where if you're not one of these midichlorian gifted people or the wealthy who buy infusions or hire or whatever, you're probably like a slave to this pharaonic super race like Eddie Redmayne in, <laughs> in Jupiter Ascending. Is that the name yeah, of the Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, nailed Jupiter it. Getting, getting low blowed by Mila Kunis. Like, just like Jar Jar by the DUM series. <laughs> right? So, yeah, but, but again, I really like that an attempt was made. I, I, I like, because we, you know, in this, these listener questions usually make us muse the possibilities. Well, George Lucas tried to do that in a movie and it misfired, but it was a, it doesn't mean it wasn't a cool idea. It's just that the longer you sit with that idea, the worse it works. I just ignore it. You know, like ever since working at a theater and watching how angry people got at Phantom Menace, I just remember making my decision when I was 17 going like, I'm not going to be these people. You know, like I'm, I'm not going to uh, be as angry as these men are about Phantom Menace. I'm just going to enjoy Star Wars. So it's, no, I, I just I just forget about it. But yeah, they're real. They're not a lie. There's no real. lie there. They're real. Okay. I'm going to drop my second one then since you dropped your second one. Okay. So I'm going to do uh, Malakili. He's the Rancor Keeper. And originally I was going to do Rancor and, and Malakili's buddy who puts his arm around him and goes, it's okay. It's okay. You know. So now and, for the listeners, is that the guy who wears a leather cowl but not a cape? Yes. Yes, he is a just a big dude who is very, very, very sad that the Rancor dies. And listen, man, a lot of people go after Return of the Jedi. Oh, it's kid stuff. It's kid stuff. But when you're a kid and you watch that Rancor Keeper walk into that room and just start crying over his monster, and then his buddy comes in, it's like, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> like, let's go get a beer. It's It made me really sad, and George Lucas had this to say. I like the idea that everyone loves someone, and even the worst, most horrible monster you can imagine was loved by his keeper, and the Rancor probably loved his keeper. And, you know, I read tales of Jabba's palace about how the two, he would sit on Rancor's foot and they would eat together, and how the Rancor helped him during, like, they would bring him out for battles and skirmishes. Like, if Jabba had an enemy who who needed killing, they brought the Rancor out. So... Just that's all in, in, in other other books, you know, other other canon. But I, I just when you're a kid and you see that Rancor Keeper crying, you know, Roger Ebert said something smart. He's like he, he said that the distress is what makes Star Wars films more than just space operas. So it's like it was it was a really interesting touch, man, because there's so many side characters and just watching this guy cry while his buddy comforts him and he just misses his Rancor. It's it's powerful stuff, man, and that's why I love Return of the Jedi so much. So I had to pick him, the Rancor Keeper. It, 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 so I, I I do like that guy. We we've talked about that a few times. Yeah, yeah. The history or long history on this show. I I, I gotta say though, really really bold in the wardrobing though. Like we've got this we've got this guy. He's not. I'm not. I'm not body shaming. I want to be clear, but like he's not a fit guy. Like this man. Looks like has the physique of Homer Simpson. And he's like, okay, I have this leather cape and cowl, but I really need to brandish my man breasts. So we're (laughs) just the cowl, just the cowl. And why is he just wearing the cowl? What is it? Is is that like is that like a uniform that a certain cast of servant or employee, almost like certain stormtroopers have certain kinds of colors and helmets 
or like, do we just not see other, do we see anyone else with this outfit? Uh, Is this just no. like the slavers wear? So maybe he's like a slaver. He actually, so he was, um, he grew up in the slums on the moon. Nar Shada. Having an affinity for animals, he was hired as a beast master, but then that beast killed some people. So then he was purchased by Jabba the Hutt, and he serves as a caretaker in, uh, of the, to the creatures in Jabba's palace uh, on the desert planet Tatooine. During that time, Malachi became fond of Jabba's rancor, Batissa, and the creature saved his life during a raider attack, and then they became buds. So I think, I don't know, when you're watching after animals, you don't want a lot of loose clothing. If someone pulled that thing off his head, it'd be off. Like it not, it's not like it would take it with him. So maybe he's just thinking practically. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, listen, it's Jabba's palace. It's hot. It's just an interesting choice. Or, or like maybe Jabba, in the same way that he had slave Leia attired, maybe Jabba also enjoys seeing this. For all I know, this guy is a slave who's just a very well-treated slave who has a lot of privileges. Or do you know otherwise from looking him up? So apparently, so re- reading, he was he was hired to be, but he was purchased. So Jabba purchased him. So he, he's like a slave. Yeah, and he take care of all the animals in Jabba's. So, so he place. seems to be a, a well privileged slave. Mm-hmm. And so maybe Jabba just likes asserting the humility of being scantily clad. Maybe he likes seeing them in that vulnerability of more skin exposed and also you can't hide a weapon as well when you are so attired yeah. except for that cowl he could hide a lot of that cowl but that aside i mean like the Gamorrean like, guards are showing a lot of leg and arms you know what i mean so it's <laughs> right? right but either way man just watching him like, putting that much thought into one character makes me happy so i had to pick him all right so now a lot, a lot of thought goes into a lot of these characters that's what makes him special that's what makes him so neat all right, so I got another question from Nick Rehack. What happened to the parents of the younglings of the Jedi Academy? Was there a massive lawsuit involved, and that's really why the Jedi fell hid to avoid the assumedly massive payouts from what Anakin did to them? So, okay, if your this, kid this... was if your kid was a youngling who got slaughtered by Anakin, I think the whole race of them gets wiped out. So, like, there's really no way for a lawsuit. I have I have a question for this question. Okay, so. Have we ever been aware of a parent of any other Jedi or youngling or or Sith other than Anakin? We don't know about Rey, right? We don't know about Ahsoka. Uh, we know about uh, we know about um, Adam Driver, right? Sure, yeah. So presumably they're Jedi because Luke is a Jedi, his dad's a Jedi or Sith. Then you have Jedi Leia, who has a Jedi kid. We don't know about Ahsoka's parents. I'm just, I'm just wondering, right? Like, do we know like, about Obi Wan's kids or parents? This is in general, we don't know. The only parents we know about are the parents because the parents are main characters. And, and then there, and then there's Anakin, where he's the Immaculate Conception, who was formed without. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the his mother even says like, no, there was no man. Up. He was just, he just, he one day he was just, I was pregnant, and was, so he was conceived by the force. So I'm just, I'm just sitting here thinking that in general, these kids were removed from their families to kind Train. of, well, to, 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 they're, they're probably from other parts of the galaxy, right? Yeah, and Order so, sixty six messed everything up. So they're not going to really I imagine know. that they were removed from their parents and that this is the life now. And their parents just acknowledge you're going to go have a better life. Cry, cry. We're never going to see you again. Right. Off you go for, for this. This is for the best. I, I, I'm assuming that's more. Yeah, they're not the, Skyping. No, I don't think so. Well, or, or we well, again, we don't know. Right. But we're giving no we're given no information to suggest that it is normal for a youngling or anyone being trained, or, or any any particular randomly chosen Jedi to have force-linked parents. Mm-hmm. Like, why wouldn't Sith just be going for their parents? Yeah. Like, if you wanted to create disarray or problems or threaten them, or right? It's like, I, I think that they are rather uh, conceptually divorced from their parents in most cases. And um, also, I just think the chaos of that order, 
No one, like, and then war broke out after that. The clone, like, just the wars broke out. So it's not, it's not going to be, like, no one's going to, re- no. And I'm pretty sure Albert, Emperor, Emperor Palpatine's going to hide it. Like, he's going to push it under the rug. He's the supreme ruler. I think, yeah, these parents aren't seeing a cent, if they even know about it. Well, and, and again, even though we, we've seen that the Force can be, uh, oh, I sense you that. know, um, v- vertically transmitted to children, it is not necessarily expected that, because um, again, like Anakin. Yeah. Or no one's talking about Yoda's dad. No one's saying <laughs> I feel like this would be mentioned. I feel like if if Yoda, if Yoda and Mace Windu, right, it, 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 Ahsoka, if they were all the offspring of other Jedi, which also they're sort of not supposed to do, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's true. So, that's the other thing. Oh yeah, because they're. Yeah, I mean, Anakin, Anakin, when he, Anakin says, "Oh no, we're we're just we're just not supposed to whatever," we're encouraged to love. Actually, we we should love. He's just trying to get laid. He's just yeah, he being, is. Yeah, yeah. It's like a jerky twenty something. But but yeah, like that's laid down too. They have this like very monkly way. So I mean, why would you be trying to limit the number of Jedi, or are you trying to limit the number of Jedi? That's never a lot of th- these are things. It's like uh, maybe some of the books explore this stuff but boy i've watched these movies a lot these things don't come up all right i'm gonna i'm let's finish nick's questions they said why haven't they adapted shadow of the empire yet now i haven't watched shadow of the empire i just know that it is a it is a multimedia project released by lucas home in 96 and it takes place and it's a multitude of products were released including a novel comic series video game trading card soundtrack and toy line it's integral to the film's Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. I don't know anything about this. Oh, okay. It looks cool though. I right, will have to research was, was that. It like a, was it like a darker game world thing? I have no idea, but it looks good. So we'll have to look into that. I just got, so here's the thing. We used to have source these questions days in advance. I asked for these today's expecting to get a, a couple and then we got loaded. So we'll answer this on a future episode. And last okay. of, of Nicholas, uh, Nick's questions. Is there a planet that would require them to wear a spacesuit of some kind? Because all the ones they went to in the films had oxygen and gravity levels just like Earth. They just walked around like normal. I feel like the stormtroopers could have removed their helmets, saved saved on maintenance and gear costs as well, and assumingly improves their accuracy when firing their weapons. So every planet they go on, they can essentially breathe. So is... Well, hold on. We we do know, even though in the earlier movies, whenever one of our heroes hit someone, it was like, ah, you know, <laughs> they're, they're done. Uh, but but that aside, we do know it is it. We are taught in the movies that their their armor is um like laser retardant. Like a, I guess it's like a direct shot or shots in certain places can can be effective. But like you'll see scuffs of where like a laser hit. And like deflected, like like a little char spot, and they're and they're fine. So they're wearing that helmet for a good reason. Yeah, the the helmet's a good reason. But smoke in in in, yeah. in, in battle, things like smoke, weird weather, sandstorms. I mean, I, these are not going to be the common things, um, but those would be additional reasons. It just looks cooler. Uh, and it, it could also it could also be if you want to have. It makes me think of uh, uh of 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 Grey Worm and his Unsullied in Game of Thrones. It's kind of a way of of taking away their identity and making it so that their their purpose is their military role. Like the stormtroopers, you know, you they all have the same uniform. They all wear that. And also, it's probably cheaper to not show people's faces and just put helmets over them because you can use them fourteen times. But it. Well, if we're like, but also, is there a plan? Like, cause is there like, do, have they ever worn a spaceship, a spacesuit? I don't think that George Lucas understands the physics of planet size and gravity, uh, and things like that. Uh, I, I don't think he thought about that very much when he came up with these ideas or he just, he just wanted it to be really simple and so that kids could enjoy it and, and streamline it and avoid these things. Uh, so that you could see our heroes all the time without a helmet when you wanted, unless they were in disguise. Because again, it's that just works better for a family movie. And mate, you know, like it's possible this choice was just made pragmatically given the audience and not 
in ignorance of very basic science and understanding of the world of space in the world. No, yeah, no, I mean this this guy made like THX, like he's a crazy smart George Lucas. I think, but like I guess in regards to this world, you know, there's midi chlorians, there's this, there's that. So I mean, there's a lot of planets that are similar. Maybe they're maybe they're just going to the planets like Hoth. Oh, we can go there. Oh, Endor, we can go there. Well, you know, Tatooine, we, we, we can go there. We always refer to the galaxy that they're in. Um, they are in different star systems. Yeah. They're in different solar systems. So it might be that, uh, boy, I really wish I could remember these numbers that Neil deGrasse Tyson was throwing out once. But, like, the number of planets in our galaxy, like, People might be, oh, what are there, like a couple hundred? It's like, I, I think there's several million. And so maybe we're seeing the, you know, maybe it's like one out of every hundred star systems has an Earth-like planet, which, by the way, is statistically improbable if you're listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson or any other astronomer, but we're waving our hands in the air. One out of every hundred star systems happen to have an Earth-like planet. Those are the planets that are inhabited. Those are the planets that we're going to. And the other 99.99% of the of the heavenly bodies are gas giants or they're their gravity is a hundredfold and it would be too dangerous and most life couldn't live there except for weird bacteria. I, you know, maybe that's just it because again, we, we are going to different star systems that yeah, comes up a lot. They're going plaid. In these movies. They're traveling. They're, you're never going, you're never going to the planet next door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. No, I think we did it. That was good. Heck yeah. Okay. So John, what's your third pick? All right. My third pick. Uh, this is also an episode one pick. This is just a random droid like those droids with the long thin heads droids it's the droid who says coruscant coruscant that does not compute uh you're under arrest <laughs> when he was trying to like either fool or jedi mind trick the the droids and i really like this and it, i i I used to think this was so stupid. Like the first 20 times I saw this movie, I, it's like that is my least favorite of all the droids because I thought that's so stupid. And now I'm sitting here wondering if you, you notice that even the most intelligent droids that we encounter in Star Wars, it's more that they have access to the information, but they are not super slick, well-spoken <laughs> Um, you know what I mean? They aren't, they're not hyper cognitive geniuses. They are just able to look up facts and tell you the facts and give you statistics. <laughs> they're not saying something is unwise because of a qualitative reason. They're saying that it's unwise because there's a 96% chance that she's going to shoot you if you give her that gun in episode, uh, seven, right? Yeah. The, yeah. So, I, I don't think that AI is so stellar for whatever reason in this world, or they have decided, which which we actually encounter in a current, well, a kind of current sci-fi show called The Foundation on Apple TV, where they had outlawed in the universe uh, intelligent robots because hmm. of the problems that come with that. So what if these, it's like these things all have these like, very basic or limited AIs. And this is kind of showing you, we talked about like the, the pit droids and how they're deliberately kept with a low logic function. Maybe again, if you, if you give too much logic to these soldiers, they'll run away from combat. They'll get nervous instead of just stupidly walking forward yeah. and firing. So it made me wonder, like, is this actually telling me something about either A, the level of technology of AI, or B, the choice in administering that AI. Well, they did I, it well with these droids, right? Like, they seem to follow command pretty... But they also had some personality. There's a scene where Darth Maul's fighting, and one droid hits the other droid on, like, the arm, and they go run over and check it out. Uh, right. I love this line. You know, th this droid's featured in this 14 sassiest droids in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, wait, uh, you're under arrest. And then he, poor, he gets sliced. But I just love the little points. I like these droids. These are probably my favorite droids in the entire franchise, John. Because they do a lot of funny things. They're, yeah. they're kind of derpy. 
there's yeah there's you're under arrest like oh and whenever i see them they make me happy so all right no, that's perfect coruscant it doesn't compute uh wait uh <laughs> you're under arrest i mean it was it was having trouble working that out yeah <laughs> oh I love, okay so you went from one droid i'm going to talk about another droid or clone and it's a stormtrooper who walks into the blast door in a new hope okay <laughs> so you know apparently two guys claim that they are the ones who did it so it's either Lori good or there's another man out there claiming so a guy named michael who is cl- michael leader who is claiming that he was the guy but regardless you know I didn't catch this, you know, I remember watching this on VHS, never caught it. I went to the special editions in the 90s, didn't catch it. It wasn't until years later when someone's like, hey, Mark, watch this. And like, I see a YouTube clip of the stormtrooper walking into the thing. And George Lucas even added in a louder clunk sound effect. And they made a joke about it in in the prequels when um, when Django bumps his head on a low clearance on the slave, let's see, on the slave one. It's like he even references that later, but they kept it in. And now if you just watch it, you can't miss it. The thing just, the guy walks straight into a door, hits his helmet, and you hear a loud clunk. <laughs> and they kept it in. And it's still in there. And it's not going anywhere. And so everyone's like, who is that stormtrooper banged his head? Like imagine being in the theater in 77, John. And you're you sitting, in, you're sitting in the crowd and you hear thunk. And you're like, wait, did that happen? Like, I would have to go buy a ticket immediately after. And be like, everybody, watch this, like, watch this scene. And then clunk. Like, you would have to build an army of people. Like, and so, I just love the moment, John. And it has, it's just so weird and it's so funny that it stayed in. It's funnier that George Lucas made the sound effect louder. Uh, it, it's just, oh, it makes me so happy. Like, he, the bump was enhanced with an obvious sound effect to draw more attention to it. So it's just the head bumping stormtrooper bump. So it just makes me happy that that this scene happened. They kept it in. They've leaned into it. I don't know what more there is to say. It's just hilarious. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so dumb. I love it so much, and it makes me so happy. All right. So we, we've we each got three in. Let's do a listener question. And we have a, a lot more, John, so we might want to knock these out pretty quick here, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, why should anyone be afraid of Darth Vader now after watching him grow from a whiny little shit? Of, this is from David Thompson, by the way, our good friend David Thompson. Why should anyone be afraid? And he did a Sorcerer episode on the podcast, which I love, on MFF. Uh, why should anyone be afraid of Darth Vader now after watching him grow from a whiny little shit of a kid to a whiny little shit of a teenager to a whiny little shit of a young adult in the early years of the trilogy? I'd say, unfortunately, because they've seen what happens in the wake of his destruction. Yeah, watch Rogue One. I mean, he he... Well, it'd be, you know, just the reputation he has, his ruthlessness, he's essentially force murdering his own officers in front of numerous subordinates just because he's displeased. He basically has a calm temper tantrum yeah. every now and then that results in the death of an officer at times. So I, I'd say that while, yes, he, he was, you know, a whiny little kid. I'll bet that Mike Tyson at age three was just another cute kid. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like Conor McGregor, again, just a just a cute little Irish kid, you know, at age three, playing soccer, kicking the ball a little off because he's not very coordinated yet and falling on his butt and giggling or, you know, like, so I, and I get, yeah, he was whiny in his 20s. It's a little different. It's not like he was the star pupil, you know, who just, you know, hadn't spent enough time in the gym yet. But I, I think that he earns his renown i mean nothing will make you more serious after getting entirely burnt up in lava and being left for dead losing three limbs yeah it's like this guy's in pain he has to sit in that tank all the time a lot of time alone he's fueled by hatred palpatine fostered that in him he turned and now he's still but you know what vader's still a brat like hey sir we lost him you know like hey sir uh, here's your coffee i wanted soy You know, like, he will kill you for things that aren't huge. If you fail again, you're dead. It's like, he's talking to his tailor. Like, it's just, he's still a brat, and he will still kill many people. So I don't think he's changed. I never thought of it that way. I I always thought of it more, and it's interesting you say that, though. I've just never thought of that, and I don't disagree with it. But I always thought of it more as, this is how he makes examples, and he is absolute. And you will do your all. And put yourself at the greatest risk possible to succeed. 
because this is the possible consequence. But now that you bring up the brat thing, this is just like the matured brat <laughs> talk quite possibly as well. Maybe I, I, that'd be awesome if everyone misreads him like, oh, man, he just expects perfection. But it, like, it, this is what he does to make an example. But in his head, he's like, you turd. <laughs> If you saw like the smirk, like the angry little smirk <laughs> on his face when he's doing it underneath that, that's why he wears the helmet all the time. Yeah. It's not the breathing. He's not going da 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 da. There it is. I love it. Perfect. Okay, Nathan Lahey, who's also a guest on MFF and worked with with John and I for many years at Comic Cons, he asked, "What other hot spots do the Tantooine book? Uh, wait, what other hot spots on Tantooine book the Cantina Band? Do they have a contract at Mos Eisley, or is there a constant fight for booking them between other towns?" So back well, in. You know, what do you oh, think? Sorry. No, no, go for I, it. I was going to say, I, I have a feeling that they're just a, like a really local group and that they like, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday play that cantina and maybe like every every other Wednesday they, they do this open mic night. And, you know, like, I I, th- I, I mean, I know a lot of band giggers. I, I feel like they just have their schedule. And, you know, every now and then when, when it's the low season, you know, they go on a tour. Yeah, yeah. They travel around a bit trying to keep, you know, make some money. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I-, I thought they were pretty good. I don't know what the quality is like elsewhere in that area. But I think they were probably pretty regular. And that was that that cantina. I don't know if we were there like on a Saturday night, but that was a hopping. Booming during the day. So like if you're th- this, I-, I feel like this is like Roadhouse. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the roughest place, but it still turns over a lot of money because it's always busy. And, and just like in both Roadhouse movies, you, he, he often have like the same band. Yeah, there. the house band. Yeah. So yeah, they they play Thursday Fridays. Like they they got a good rotation there. But you, you don't want to go to the same bar that's playing the same music music all seven days a week. But it's you know a lot of people fly in there though. But those are there there are a lot of yeah like people they're gigging their like. What is it? Bounty hunting or crime mm-hmm. or whatever they're doing. So yeah, they do at least two days a week there. What do you think? I think so. That's All reasonable. Right. One more, one more question. David Thompson again. What happened to the trash compactor monster in Star Wars: New Hope? Was it somebody's pet? They flushed it and, and they flushed it down the toilet like a baby alligator. I That's think, interesting. I read about He's, this guy. Um, John, do you know about this monster? I, no, no. I was just gonna. Have, if there's actually a good theory out there, I'd lo- I'd love to hear it. So these things are called. Dion, Dianagas, D, D-I-A-N-O-G-A, Dianaga, something like that. So they're cephalopods. They can grow up to 10 meters and they grow up to approximately five or six meters. They have a single eye stalked and they can eat creatures. But here's the thing. They, they originated in planet Vaudrin. But what they did was they started fa- like getting on ships and living in their trash compactors. So then somehow one of them got on board of the, like, they're a problem. They're a menace. And I guess one of them got on the Death Star and just lived in the garbage compactor and just ate the food there. Like, it was kind of like, you know when you put lemon in your trash compactor to freshen it up? Like, I feel like that's what they do. And it just got, it's in there. And I'll I'll bet there are, you know, things that are like the equivalent of, you know, like sewer rats and things like that that get down there too. That's essentially, yeah, part of me wonders also, if, like, you know, whatever the larval or immature form or egg form of that was, again, like, even as you said, whether it's like a pet or just like attached to some ship, almost like Luke's ship that went in that, that swamp and then they levitated out. What if that ship crashed into, in, it was, was in the Death Star, they took him prisoner, it didn't go out the way he wanted him to, and then they compact it. But it had this like muckety muck swamp egg on it, you know, like yeah, could have gotten there a lot. But again, it could, like you said, it could have been a pet. Someone could be just like almost like the collector Benicio del Toro, like just like traveling around and showing off interesting creatures, or kind of like half of Florida's reptiles and amphibians are invasive species because of the pet trade. Yeah, it's definitely invasive species, I would say. It somehow got on board. They also say that they're self-fertilizing hermaphrodites, and they can quickly multiply to pose a, pose a larger problem. But I, I read here that they're, they're, people don't really mind them until they get huge. So it's like you have something that's, you know, it's just like it's just a creature eating trash and doesn't bother you, but then they get too big. No one really ever goes in there. Like an alligator in Florida. Yeah, there it like is. If I saw if there was like a four foot alligator. 
no, two feet from it. the sidewalk. I wouldn't even go walk or walk away from it. I just walk right back. You're not doing anything to me, you little guy. <laughs> but you know, then you get like, you know, when it, when it's like four feet and it weighs like 40 pounds, but then you get the, the, the eight footer that weighs 350 pounds and you got a problem. You're going to the other side of the street. I'm, I'm, I'm I'll, 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 I'll go around it for sure. Right. I mean, listen, the thing blew up anyway. So presumably <laughs> it was just living its little cephalopod life though. You know, like it was just like, a, a, a great meal fell in, yeah. right? And it's like, ooh, this is great. Like it doesn't know. It doesn't think it's murdering somebody. It's just eaten. Yeah. Like imagine John, if like a giant triple IPA and a nice chicken breast with all your favorite toppings is dropped in front of you. I'm, I'm in. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna go for it. I don't know if that thing registers emotions well it might not know that you don't want to be eaten it's just like why can't i eat this thing i need to work harder to grab and eat this i live in a sewer this is an easy meal i mean this might just be you know like trying to hit a coconut harder against a rock to get it to open as far as the concept goes with, with its cephalopod brain i don't know or it's very intelligent and it knew exactly what it was doing. well cephalopods like, are quite smart aren't they it's like those are people you know people say that like there was that show about the octopus and their problem solving the the as a biologist, I think one of the problems with shows like that is that it is the intelligence that we perceive that we find special and identify as an intelligence. But the intelligence that we fail to perceive, we identify as non-intelligence. So the fact that we can relate to the intelligence that we are observing makes us think that that thing is particularly intelligent. But really, it's just the kind of intelligence that we identify with. Well, what about pigeons? They're one of the smartest creatures out there because they can adapt to anything. They can survive anywhere. They like they can live in the city. You rarely see them you getting s- hit by cars. You like, say that? I've seen pigeons in a city in Paraguay. I've never seen a pigeon in the woods in Paraguay. How so? How do you think? How do you think that works? I, I'm just saying they 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 are particularly well suited for disturbed uh, human inhabited areas. Yeah. And now they hardly exist That's in true. natural habitats. You never just see a pigeon hanging out in the woods. Dude, like me, when I'm in Peru, I don't see a pigeon. <laughs> Unless I'm in Lima in the city. But a pigeon would get wiped out by like a hawk pretty easy. Pigeons I, are big. I mean, it's a good meal. <laughs> it's a good meal. All right. What's your, uh, what's your, what's your fourth pick, John? Fourth pick. Okay. Uh, also, Star Wars Episode One. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Star Wars Episode One. Gardula Basadi. I might be mispronouncing that. Gar- Gardula Basadi Hut the Elder. When 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 Jabba and a female hut are are coming to their balcony to watch the pod race, I was always intrigued by the female hut, and it is specifically a female brut. Mm-hmm. The hut it has breasts, and even some of its facial aspects, when 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 you pause it, are a little more feminized, just a little, but they are. So this got me thinking about something that I never really thought about before, and I don't know why, but we have all these different races or species of humanoids, et cetera, in Star Wars from this one galaxy, basically, right? But all these different star systems, all these different humanoid-ish races, right? And or species, maybe these things, you know, like Sebulba probably isn't, you know, like having offspring with a human. But and I don't mean because of choices. I wonder if it's even possible. But I love Sebulba. <laughs> why, why is it that they're all so similar? Did one race, one species enter this galaxy and then make its way around? And then over the course of thousands of millennia in their remote star systems back when space travel was a little harder, just evolutionarily diverged and and took on very different forms, almost like pygmies in Papua New Guinea. Uh, And when uh, when North America was first explored, the Seminole, not the Seminole, the Indians in South Florida, maybe it was the Seminoles, were like very tall for the time. Like they were they were as tall as the average person is now or taller we're back in a time when the average healthy upper class well-fed male was like five foot five. 
Um, so like, or is it just that kind of divergence, but multiplied over a period of time that's thousands and thousands of times longer than human existence that we have these different races that in species that look so different that breasts are on a, a, a hut. Well, hut is the clan, but whatever that species name is, just as they are on most of the other humanoid race females, it, it's just a, I never really put much thought into it until I, I, I watched episode one for like, I don't know, the 20th time. And and this just popped in my head. And we don't really see or hear about half blood races between like two species, you know, like there's no weak way Sabalba mix. Right. But but at the same time, we have uh, what what we would identify as. Well, Asian actors, uh, 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 African American actors, Hispanic actors, distinctly white West Anglo heritage actors among the humans, showing the diversity within the human race oh. or species, if you will. So now, and granted, that's just casting too, mm-hmm. right? But like we, but we see that, um, what is it, Twilex, uh, uh, have different, very different, um, skin patterns, like color patterns. So does Darth Maul's species. I can't remember the name of it right now, but his species has very different uh, skin-like appearances. Is that like our white, black, Asian, or you know what I mean? Uh, So so do they have their own races within their species? Um, And again, why don't we have someone who's half Darth Maul's species and half human? Or maybe we do. And they just look like one of the parents. I don't know. This just, I, I like exploring these ideas in these worlds. If this was like a five season show, you know, if this was like the expanse, this stuff would probably come up eventually. You know, even if it was just mentioned in a passing sentence. Right. I love but the expanse. I, um, you like the expanse? I, you know, I never got into it. Oh, man. It's like one of my favorite all time sci fi shows it. of all time. But, I, and by the way, to that effect. We know that Jabba physically fancied Leia. Yeah. Even did things that we would consider a slimy, salacious, criminal, exploitative man to do to her when he's like licking her and Mm -hmm. the way he uh, dresses her. Um, So, again, these are just they're interesting thoughts. I don't know. You know, you know, I think it's funny. You know, when they were making this film, they were probably like, let's make cool monsters. Let's make them different. Let's make them interesting. Let's make them unique. Let's go, let's go to town. Let, let's make hundreds of different creatures. But by doing that, you're like, wait a second. What is, like, who is this from? Why have they mingled? Where are they from? How did this go? How did they go? You know what I mean? It made some very interesting, because it's not just like humans. There's all the regular humans that are on this earth. But then you toss in a few billion other species. But they can go to intergalactic travel, so I guess that makes sense. No, no, there is no intergalactic travel. Actually, we only ever hear about the one galaxy until there's um, until uh, oh uh, yeah, Palpatine's special hidden planet in oh, another gosh, galaxy. Yeah. I think in Episode Nine. So everything. I'm sorry, Star Wars super fans, if I'm getting this a little wrong, but in general, everything is in one galaxy. In these movies, in these shows, mm. in general, I think I, and I think what it was it uh, the last season, of The Mandalorian, when they went to where that blue general was, I think that was actually out of the galaxy. That was. But they're very or no, Ahsoka, that was that might have been the one true time that they left the galaxy because yeah, they, they had it. to build the special ships and teleport themselves um, out there. It's like a, a dark zone. But, but again, so it's like we don't have intergalactic travel worth it, but a galaxy is still mega huge like we hardly understand i guess in this world a galaxy is like like 10 a million of our galaxies i don't know if that's true our galaxy is again i think that we have like literally millions of planets right i mean that's still a good variation of life um right right but But again i just wonder what seeded that how'd that start because i don't think it's multiple independent uh spawnings of things that all happen to be humanoid and then that happen to be sexually attracted to one another. Jabba's gross. 
And I, I mean, down to the noses, you know, the mm. noses and eyes on, you know, it's it's like Star Trek, though. Sometimes it's because of budget. But that these races are all like one subtle difference. Right. When you think of the old Star Treks, otherwise they just look like a person. But again, budget, for example, that might be the the the, the driving factor behind some of these uh, uh, things that I'm waving my hands at. But it's still canon and there's still different races. So then you got to think about that as well. So it's. It's knowing the production, but also knowing that they're creating this world. So it's, I don't know, but still fun. I love exploring this kind of stuff. Yeah. Do you want to know my, all right, so my fourth pick is from Return of the Jedi, and it's Nanta, the Ewok who gets murdered by the ATSD. Oh, no. Right? <laughs> and then his buddy, so I, I found their names here, because for a long time, it was kind of crazy. People just called it Corpsey, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, this, it was Nanta. <laughs> And then its buddy Ramba was the one that was shaking him. So the Ewok, you see, you see the Ewok a couple times when it's by the net traps, and then he he dis- he takes Wookiee's bowcaster, and then they fall to their knees and worship C-3PO. But during the battle, the ATSC is chasing him, shoots him, and then one of them dies, and his buddy's like, "Oh no!" and like just completely bummed out. And it's just crazy, John. Like between the the Rancor keeper crying. And just this tiny moment where you just witness this adorable little Ewok who's wildly outmatched, battling for everything it has, getting murdered, and then its buddy showing remorse for it. You know, for a kid, you start thinking about, like, life and death, and you felt for this thing. It hurt. That moment hurts. And that thing's on screen for 30 seconds. But just watching Nanta die... it always gets me, man, because it's just a very – I know Lucas did not direct the movie, you know, but it still it still hits. And it's still a very Star Wars moment that you can just feel like like the rest of the film. So I, I think that moment's great. And with very little screen time, that, that little Ewok's death has scarred so many people. There's a lot of personality there. Yeah. yeah. And it's like that's that's like one of the only deaths in all of the Star Wars movies where you're like – Whoa. <laughs> it's terrifying, man. So I pick that and it because it still Old breaks my heart. Creature. <laughs> All right, so next I'm gonna go Nathan LaHaye. He said, Was Porkins a nickname for the hefty pilot in New Hope? Or was he born with that at, uh, as his name and he decided to lean into it? So actually that's the name. Porkins Porkins was the name. It was Jack Tono Porkins. And his nickname was Piggy. Wait, his nickname was Piggy? Yeah. Remember that. So then he was Did fighting. Did they say but, that in the movie? It's in the books later on. But, okay. but from the movie, his name is Porkins. And so, yeah. But it's kind of crazy that that happens, like Porkins. and But no, so his name was actually Porkins. It was not a nickname. His nickname was Piggy. So there you go, Nathan. Uh, let's see. Let me get at someone who has a uh, Joe Ross. Why isn't Gold Squadron considered the true heroes of the original Death Star run? How many guns do you think there are? Gold 5. They cleared the way for those glory hog red squadroners to come and clean up the mess. So he's saying R.I.P. John Dutch Vander of the Gold Squadron, who led the trench run, and they took out the guns in the Death Star. Do you ever think about the the those guys, John? No, but now I'm going to. <laughs> I, kind of, I feel badly for them now. Yep, so they were... They were Let's see. The Gold Squadron, also referred to as Gold Group, was a starfighter squadron in the Masasi Group Rebel, Rebel Cell, the Alliance to Restore the Republic, and eventually the New Republic. The squadron, the squadron headquartered on Yavin 4 and was commanded by John Dutch uh, Vander and flew BTL A4 Y Wing light bombers. The group fought in some of the earliest consequential bottle, uh, battles. And so in New Hope, let's see. Yeah, in New Hope, they, they led the way for the trench run. And then Vader ended up killing them because they were with them, but they made the run in there. So it's, it's kind of like, yeah, they, they came, but they all died. And then eventually when, when they had the later battle, the battle of Endor, they were part of it as well. Like red group, gold group. So gold group, like they were, they were laying people out in that fight, but it's interesting. So they, they took out, let's see, where is this at? Yeah. A flight of three gold fleece. Three Gold Squadron Y-Wings flown by Vander, Dextry, and Cap Davish were the first to make the attack run on a Death Star's trench. And they, they helped to get in there, um, 
and they helped they they they, they like ran in there re, they recalibrated for fast like they did a lot of work and then Luke came in and won it but they all three were shot down by Vader but they did some good work so just want to get that out there so Joe Ross wonderful question now we have Jesse Deal and he put do you have a favorite spoof of Star Wars favorite spoof I mean like Robot Chicken's great Family Guy's great but it's always going to be Spaceballs like. Sir, we ain't found shit, you know, like trusting the Schwartz and oh, merchandising, really good, yeah. like because good is dumb, like big helmet and like I always drink coffee while watching radar. This the amount of like barf, like DJ Johnson and I, who you know well, John, he, he I would always whenever I got in his car, I would go barf, and he's like, not in this car, Mister. So like you know, as much as I love the robot chicken ones, the Family Guy ones, I got to go with Spaceballs. Boy, I do like the Family Guy one, but Spaceballs is just such a movie of our youth. It's it's hard to compete with that. There are a lot of bad movies that that, that play a bit on Star Wars, but honestly, I can barely remember them. <laughs> but I've seen like I still remember seeing from obscure like random like 1979 to like 84 weird movies where there's something like a lightsaber. <laughs> yeah, but like, do you think like is that your favorite Spaceballs? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a pretty fair, easy, easy conclusion. I do love the robot chicken ones, and the Family Guy ones were were quite inspired. And then John, this is from our one of our Norwegian listeners. So it's Thomas, and I'm sorry, Thomas, don't don't kill me. Uh, L- Lillerov, uh, that's his last name, L I L L E R O V D E. Wonderful listener, is on MFF a lot. He's a big fan of the Seven Lamb guys. John, John, you know Robert Lamb. His show was number one on all of Spotify's fiction podcasts, which is gigantic. So like Robert Lamb's blowing up, so it's fun to see. But Thomas asks, why do why does Lando wear Han Solo's clothes when he's flying the Millennium Falcon? And I researched this, and apparently they're like he had no time after leaving Jabba's palace because he was undercover for years. He just found some extra clothes. Yeah, so he just raided. Han, they're about the same size, so he raided Han's closet. Sure. Is wait is that is that considered the reason? Well, that's what people have said. I researched yeah. it. I, okay. So I, I looked it up. And why is Lando in Han's clothes? And it said his baffled fans. Blah, blah, like he loves capes and brightly colored shirts. Why does he have to dress like Han Solo? And then there's some fan theories that they're saying that like it was out of necessity. And that he just needed to grab them. So that seemed like the most. And like the gang, they had to go to the Millennium Falcon pretty quickly. So he didn't have like clothes with him. He didn't have his capes with him. So. And then also someone said. Let's see. Empire, for example. Oh, someone asked him that. First, the host claimed that the design was made by designer Joel, who said it didn't mean anything. Let's see. The Han get up is part of the Corillian Corpse uniform. It has been suggested that the outfit is a remnant of a flight uniform, and so a natural choice for any pilot. But really, what better way for filmmakers to suggest that Han is really gone and to set up Lando as his replacement, complete with his ship and his fashion sense? Oh, I guess the guy... Oh, at a Wizard World con, Billy D. Williams. We were probably working this show. All right. But yeah, so they're saying it was either the outfit or he just raided Han's closet. Yeah, no, I think raiding the closet makes sense. It still feels like there should have been like one line of dialogue. <laughs> what are you doing in my vest? Yeah. Why? I didn't have any clothes. I need to, I need something to wear. And that's it. Right? <laughs> Solved. Done. Uh, all right. So, John, so I know we, we, we got to get out of here, but let's do our fifth picks. And then we have two questions, a quick answer. So what's your fifth pick? Uh, My fifth pick is the, I don't. Remember the pronunciation, the Kaminoans. They are the tall, wispy, amphibious cloning race yeah. from the Clone Wars. The water planet. And they're, they're, the, they're, they're so tall and long, like, boy, whiplash would be devastating to them. That would just break their neck. <laughs> and, and I, I find this, this species very interesting because when you look up pictures of them from games or comics, they're all built like that. It's not like there's a body, but well, I didn't look hard, but they all seem to be super long and and slight like i wasn't seeing any like super buff ones like zangief from you know street fighter so i'm sitting here wondering that even though maybe now in their in the long timeline of their species they're primarily bioengineers and cloners and that's just their niche business as an entire species in in the galaxy but like how'd they get there They've probably been at war back when they were at a a lesser technological state. Like, what are they? Do do, do they are any of them more physical or or do they have 
are any of them Jedi? Do they have telekinesis? Not that we see it. Like these wispy things would, would be very easily overpowered. I feel like in a, in a, in a, in, in anything that has any physicality because they're like, they're like eight feet tall, but like a hundred pounds. Does that mean that they're just so far transcended life and intelligence and battle that they just focus on nothing but intellect and have avoided those battles? I mean, well, but at some point yeah, they've had in a their skirmish. history, there, there realistically would have been something, right? I, I just wonder like what their warfare looked like, how they, maybe they went about it a certain way. Like they're more like the, the, the bow and arrow clan as opposed to the tomahawk clan you know what i mean like i i'm just i just wonder or maybe they're they're super quick and agile and they're amazing grapplers beats me even though they they don't have a lot of like muscle mass i i just want i you know i saw them too they have four arms right like was goro one of them just with on anabolics whoa was like yeah. was mortal Kombat goro a Kaminoan. <laughs> they even have, I think the finger count might even be correct, but I don't remember. I don't remember. Well, low blows work on them. Like, well, yeah, you know, it's right in the, the cloaca. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, yeah, it's, all right. I mean, four on, I mean, hmm, four, I mean, they'd probably be good knife fighters. Like, wait, well, that, you know, see, that's a neat idea too, right? Yeah, just because they have the extra limbs kind of thing. They could be a, a little dangerous. Like, look at gazelles. They're not huge, but they can move. I mean, these things got reach. They do have reach. I'll try to, yeah. So, this, yeah, they, they's got to be fast. And I, they definitely would shoot a bow and arrow, John. Look at that reach. They could get the longest bow possible. And maybe I wonder the if they can shoot What's two bows at once. If replacements taught us anything, they could be wiry. Wiry. I love this. They, st- they stay in shape by Welsh standards. I love the detective work in Attack of the Clones. This is a great pick. Well, all right. So when when there he's at the base though, when Obi Wan's at the base, one of the one of the uh, Kaminoans is wearing this kind of neck brace that looks like it could prevent whiplash. So maybe they have braces that wrap around their neck to prevent them being chopped off too easy. Because I mean that might at- be a liability too. Yeah. We're wearing like a, wearing like a, a gorget like that. True. Limit their mobility. I, don't know, I wouldn't it's, want to fight it's, one. It's just a curious, just a curious thought. Just, a, just, just an interesting little. Uh, why are those necks so long? Why do their necks even need to be that long? What, 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 by what nature did their bodies adapt in that form? Like a. They just need to look over shells. Dude, these things are amphibious. <laughs> they don't necessarily look like good swimmers. <laughs> That's a great point. Maybe their head works like an engine. Just like a propeller it spins around <laughs> they actually go backwards it just spins <laughs> like a gyroscope and they, they go backward they go feet first oh man all right so from that pick i'm go- hey, hey i'm going to another very skinny character i'm going from cobb vanth timmy ollie now he's quite of a ma- major character but i had to include timmy ollie because when he popped up in boba fett's armor in mandalorian i lost it and i love this quote I've never met a, ma- a real Mandalorian. Heard stories. I know you're good at killing. You're probably none too happy to see me wearing this hardware. So I figure only one of us is walking out of here. But then I see the little guy. And I think maybe I pegged you wrong. And it's it's so Timmy Ollie. And then when he was interviewed for, by Rolling Stone, he said, I enjoyed that. He's like, I don't know if it was a cash grab or if I'm just getting lazy, but I'm okay playing the greatest hits right now. Like he played mm-hmm. a very justified character. He played a very Deadwood character in it. But he's just perfect in the role. And just seeing him in Boba Fett outfit working with Pedro Pascal to kill a crate dragon and then battle other people in other shows, but it's incredible. So it makes me very happy. I had to go with Timmy Ollie. Yeah, he, he, he's, it was nice seeing him in the show. He's, he's always a pleasure. I mean, we look, we're products of the 90s, so we love him. All right, let's knock out the final questions here. John, we have two left. So we have, let's see, by Nathan LaHaye. The original Death Star was destroyed by the Rebels after being toted as an indestructible. As indestructible, what kind of incentives did the Empire make the stormtroopers, engineers, contractors, and officers in order to convince them to work on the second one? Keep it running while under construction, ultimately uh, lead it into battle unfinished. So you're working on Death Star. The first one was blown up. How do you get people to work on the second one? Uh, you, you don't know, really order them. You, just, you, you are working here. 
contract work, man. I don't know. I don't don't know what the news cycle's like out there. You know, like if you're from another star system, like, right, because communication is a little interesting. Despite all their technology, communication has a range. It's mostly like, like radio, like hollow, those hologram, like telegrams, like it's, it's not, it's not that advanced. So like, maybe they don't even know they're just being contracted. They didn't even know what this thing was until they already moved over there with their wife and kids and got the job. You're like people who built the home for HH homes, he would hire them, then fire them. They didn't even know what they're building. These people are building a planet, John. So if you're a specialist in welding, you're going to, you're, you're only going to move like a square mile a year. So you're not going to know entirely what this thing is. Or, or maybe, you know, I mean, the empire, uh, you know, had its exploitative side. So they might have had disproportionate funds than you would expect, and they could pay very well. I mean, that's why there's truck drivers. That's why there's teamsters. That's why there's welders. That's why people work on film sets 15 hours a day. They get paid well. Like, you know, it's just like, yeah, this, this was the job. I've got, I've got, you know, galactic debts. That's why you go on a lobster boat during the season to make money. Like the biggest catch, you know, you, you need to get pay and these people are paying. I mean, yeah, you know, it's like the the more I think about it, actually more practical it becomes, right? Even if you knew, even if you knew the whole story, you'd be like, well, I mean, this is a job. I'm going to be employed for years on this. Like we are set. There's no exhaust port this time. We're getting a family dorm. They're going to put the families. They're going to put the kids in, in, in the into the Death Star school system. <laughs> it's a great school system. Well, actually, they're probably have a lot of school systems. But you know what I mean? It's like it, it just the benefits package made sense. Yeah, I, I got Innovator U. It's awesome. I get to go study right. there. Yeah, and yeah, we're we're working on force chokes this semester. Like we have a force field. We don't have a thermal thing, a, a little hole that you can shoot rockets into. You're safe. You're good. And we're on a planet that's heavily fortified. Only a little Ewoks are on there. And Vader can feel the force. You're set. It's fine. All right, so our final questions. David Thompson, was it normal for a Jedi Knight to return as a space ghost after a Jedi Knight died? Can anyone see them, or do you have to be a Jedi? Is it a little freaky to have space ghosts constantly following you around? I've never been a fan of all this. I want I just want that on the record. You're not the a space ghoster? I'm not, I'm not a fan. Not a fan of all the force ghosting. I almost want to believe that when Luke saw Obi-Wan's Force Ghost, that it was the force of Luke's mind producing that to give him guidance and not a Force Ghost. You know what I mean? That was how I would have preferred to believe that that existed. It's just a lot. Because re- listen to this, John. The Force Ghost was the soul and essence of a deceased Force-sensitive person who denied the will of the Force upon death, yet was able to interact with the living. It also described those who had come to terms with death and invoked this technique to preserve their identity, manipulating their own something to guard against being absorbed into the force in such a way that they would lose their identity. That's a lot. I, I don't. It's too much. Yeah, it's way too much. I. Mm-mm. You know when it works better. Remember in Happy Gilmore when he looks up and he sees Abraham Lincoln, the alligator, and, and Tubbs, or yeah. Tubbs like waving. That's more believable. It, it, well, it, until you have young Anakin Force ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, talk about that they added into the original trilogy. Yeah, having Anakin, having Hayden in there is odd. All right. We did it, John. We got to get out of yeah, here. I was, uh, oh, we're missing one. We're missing actually our first listener question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, crap. Michael. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do that one. I, I yeah, got yeah. it handy. So, so Michael Bernal, a recent transplant from Tampa to Charleston, South Carolina, asks, Ooh. do you think the Sarlacc – is more closely related to the sandworms from Dune or the graboids from Tremors. It's said that they have a consciousness, these sarlaccs. And the sandworms have a pretty good consciousness. And the Tremor, well, you know what? That's a good, I mean, yeah, but you know what? That's really interesting. Okay, I've got an idea. All right, let's hear it. An idea, because we don't know when in the timeline... Do the the Dune movies that we saw happened with respect to the Star Wars movie. I'm sorry, like like Dune is in the future, right? Dune mm-hmm. is way in the future. Star Wars is is a long, long, long time, time ago. ago in a galaxy far, far away. So perhaps the sandworms in Dune are in fact 
the later evolved form of the sarlax. And it is, in fact, the same species through time. And it has just changed with time. I mean, yeah, there's already like space whales and there's already sarlax. And sarlax, I guess, could travel through space so they could travel and become something else thousands, millions of years in the future. And and and, and wait. And the graboids that happened in the middle, right, in, 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 in our Mankind on Earth timeline, the graboids are sarlacc sandworm larvae oh. that came in in a, in a meteorite, right? And that meteorite space jumped because it was loaded with spice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would <laughs> into be. Into our galaxy. Although I think they had to use that in like an engine to harbor it or something, but still, by the way, so it was, it was some meteorite and they were like, literally like there were eggs and these are like literally the larvae and the earlier form, the Sarlacc form had those tendrils. Remember like the, mm-hmm. the three, it was three, had the three tendrils in it. That's why the Sar, that's why the, the graboids, these larvae have their three tendrils. Yeah. Right. Let's ignore the VFX Sarlacc telling you that I, I think that's it i think they're all the same species and in, in three different times and two different life stages you did it i love it that's incredible i don't have a better answer i like it all right john what, what do you got to promote you good to go a john's horror corner if you google john's horror corner you'll find me on any social media where i exist which is probably everything but tiktok Nice. Yeah, go follow John. He writes great stuff, has a great Instagram page, and reads reviews at Movies, Films, and Flicks. And thank you for everyone for reading Movies, Films, and Flicks. We've had an uptick in in views, so it's kind of nice. Thank you for reading us. It's been a banner 12 months. Yeah, I'm writing reviews again. It's nice. And I'm publishing more data posts, so it's good. John, thank you so much for joining me, man. Cheers, man. Always a good time. So for me, Mark Hoffmeyer, for John Levengood, this is Movies, Films, and Flicks. We'll see you next week.